Bodie Van Rock out. Here's Dad, and here's my Rickenbacker. Because in my last interview, I say I play Rickenbacker. Now. So do you remember who we're interviewing today? No. It's Will Bernard. Okay. He's a jazz guitar player. He's from Berkeley. Cool. That's where I was born. Yeah, you were born in Berkeley. So that's I pretty said cool. Burn. Uh, you're born? Yeah, I meant to say born, but I said burn. <laughs> I was there. So uh, yeah, he's going to call us and he just released a new album and we're going to talk about that. It's really amazing. I've seen him play quite a few times. Hmm. He was in this great band called James T. Kirk and then they had to change the name because there's some like Star Trek guy that's got that name or something. And it should be a fun interview. So stay tuned. We'll have him on in just a second. The Magical Mystery Tour. The mind make a reservation. I mean, I meant to say you got it. He is calling. All there he right. is. Well, Bernard. I said it wrong. Hi there. Hey, hey well. Wait. How about now? Hey, hey how are you? Good. Can you hear the audio okay? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear us? It's a little chopped up somehow. Hopefully it gets better. We have the worst uh, internet connection here. Okay. Where we're, are you guys? We're in Alameda. Are you still in Berkeley? No, I'm, I'm in uh, New York, in Brooklyn. Oh, okay, okay. But, I, but I'm, I'm back and forth. I'm actually flying out there tomorrow. Oh, okay. What are you going to be doing out here? Uh, well, my, I'm, I have family out there. I'm you know, doing some family stuff. Right on, right on. So why don't you introduce yourself? Really. Tell us like, what you've been up to really quickly. Uh, let me... Uh, I'm turning you up a little bit. Yeah, perfect. So this is for a blog? What is this for? This is for Bodie's Backstage Pass. So I've been writing about music since the 90s. And then um, your publicist reached out to me. And I usually um, do things on my cannabis blog that's been around for like 15 years. But um, okay. we talk, thought that this would be a cooler fit because we have a much better um, reach, you know. The um, social media platforms don't necessarily always dig the cannabis content, so they're always knocking that stuff down. And you know, now I get to do this with somebody who's a huge music fan and just starting out getting Matt, to. That's who's me. this person here? So this is Bodie. Bodie, you're Bodie. Hi, Bodie. Yep, this is this show, man. So um, yeah, I grew up in the Bay Area. I've seen you play um, a bunch of times. I've seen the T.J. Kirk shows and. Um, yeah, so we want to like just tell us um, like how you got your start in the Bay Area as a um, you know guitar player. Yeah, I mean that's the Bay Area is my home, Berkeley, California. Went to all the you know schools in Berkeley, public schools, and um, I was around uh, during the late '60s is when I probably got really into music, started music, and uh, got into the. Uh, all the scene that was around here as much as I could living as a young person, you know, collecting uh, Rolling Stone magazines when it was a newspaper and Berkeley Barb and listening to uh, <clears throat> K-San radio. Are you, are you from the Bay Area? Yeah, yeah, we're, I'm from the Bay Area and like, yeah, we're still here in Alameda. I was okay. born in Berkeley. Yeah, this guy was born in Berkeley. Yeah. So, um, what got uh, you? Part of my, you know, upbringing, and um, uh, I was more of a rock person until like the mid '70s. I got more into um, jazz because of probably because of the fusion, you know, mixing it up that brought rock people over. And then I got more interested in jazz as well. And then uh, hooked up with people at Berkeley High, where they have a big jazz program still. And um, so that really changed my life, you know. So what was your favorite rock bands? My favorite rock band? Yeah, when I was growing up or? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, the first one was the Beatles was my band. You know, they wanted, they're the ones that uh, made me want to get into music. 
more heavily and then uh i got into bands like led zeppelin and uh who i saw at berkeley community theater and you know stephen stills and um i was just into everything anything i could listen to i liked at that time you know it was a time where it was like a it was a really different time for music there was a it was a much smaller part of the society and there was a a smaller amount of music to listen to in terms of uh rock music you know so how did you get into jazz music um well like i said i uh i don't know if you know what a um fusion is you know what that kind of music is um i never heard of fusion it's a mixture of jazz and rock oh. so in the 70s there were people experiment earlier even but there were people experimenting with uh combining jazz and rock together and uh they would uh um bring jazz to a wider audience so they would play in big places like uh 2000 seat places whereas a lot of the more traditional jazz people would be playing in these little clubs where there would be maybe 50 to 100 people you know like who so, are some of your um like favorite jazz fusion artists that like kind of caught your eye in in the 70s yeah i mean so you know i was going in the 70s i was going to winterland and seeing a lot of rock shows at the winterland and and then uh so i you know i think ma vishnu orchestra john mclaughlin was the they had a on case case stand they had an ad for one of their new record and i would, i just never heard anything like it so i started following them and getting into these other people a lot of people that worked with this guy named miles davis have you heard of him bodhi no and uh <laughs> he's he an incredible trumpet player so um a lot of people that worked with him had spin-off bands like Chick Corea and um uh Wayne Shorter, Weather Report, Joe Zolden and all. Um uh and a lot of amazing music from that time and then Frank Zappa. Have you heard of Frank Zappa? My dad has and he showed me a couple of songs of Frank. I kind of liked them. Yeah. So that was he was a big guy for me, you know. Oh, that's awesome. You know, I was reading a magazine years ago and it was like Trey Anastasio was talking about his favorite like guitar records and he mentioned the tribute to Jack Johnson record by you know Miles Davis's with um John McLaughlin on it and I mean that just blew my mind and it's just it was such a great record you know that's probably one of my favorites from that era what are like some of your favorite like records that kind of like encapsulate that like jazz fusion well, um, I, there's a guy here that I've been working with lately called, uh, his name is Bill Laswell. And he, uh, uh, he, um, I'm skipping ahead maybe. That's fine. We love Bill. I, we love but, uh, Bill Laswell's a very uh, visionary producer. And he, um, he did um, what they call a remix where they take a, some tracks that were already on a tape in this case way before your time they had these tapes that were uh, about this wide have you ever seen a cassette tape yes i actually uh, listened to a couple because uh, i found um, a nirvana um, cassette and um and my dad used to have this cd player that also played cassettes so i just put I popped it in and Listen to Smells Like Teen Spirit too much. How <laughs> hey, you listen to Teen Spirit? Yeah. On a, yeah, that's probably good on a cassette. So yeah, that was the 90s, the, that, that era. That was probably the era when I was uh, starting to get more interest, you know, involved in the music business and uh, playing. You know, we opened for Nirvana one time at the Cow Palace. Was, place. <laughs> was it a Halloween show? Was it around like in the nineties? It was a, uh, it was a show for. It was a benefit for. It was when the, the Bosnia and Serbian War. It was a, a benefit for, uh, for victims of that 
uh, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. Gotcha. What band were you playing in at that point? Uh, Michael Frante and uh, Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy. Yeah, that was a, I love that band. That was a great band. Uh, what's that, was Charlie Hunter in that band as well? Yeah, well, he, I took his place for just a very brief period, and then um, it didn't really work out. So, okay. But then that was when we started TJ Kirk around that time too. Okay, let's go back to Bill Laswell. I mean, he's such a a great like producer, and just he's worked with so many really interesting folks. Have you ever recorded with him or worked with him live? Yeah, we were we've played a we have a band called Revelator, and we're yeah with Peter Affelbaum and Aaron Johnston and we're um, um, we're, we're, we're gonna we were about to make a record but then this COVID thing happened and things were more difficult so is there anything out there that we could listen to that the fans there's, can uh, there's some uh, I have a YouTube channel you should subscribe and uh, I, have I have some of the stuff with Laswell on there absolutely right on I had no idea man okay um, so, so I've been, uh, you know, he hires me. I've, I've been a big fan of his for a while. Look at that hat. Um, they have been f fan of his for a long time. And um, he, uh, so now he's been hiring me to do sessions and um, he's become a pretty good friend. That's awesome, man. I love it. So that's like one of the things like when we moved moving to New York, you know, get to meet people like that. What what um so what was the genesis? Dead of stop! Okay. Wait, it's time for Borando Question! Now hold up the sign. All right, well, this is Bodie's favorite part of the show. Yeah. Apologize in advance. This is the part of the show where I tell I tell the person that we're interviewing a random question. Time, okay, to Time to think of a random question. Hmm. Oh, you you got to have that. It's pretty random if you haven't thought of it yet. I got it. <laughs> if you had the decision to invite three people to a tea party, non living, animated, not real, what would those three people be? A what party? This. Any type of party. Any type of party. Wow. That'd be fun. <laughs> Maybe, uh, okay, I'm just going to do off the top of my head, I'm going to say Frank Zappa, uh, John Coltrane, and Igor Shavinsky. That's a great, that's a great combo. <laughs> so, I'm, I want to, um, so what was the reason why you moved to New York to just be, to just further the career and like start collaborating with more, more folks? Yeah, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's, uh, well, you know, when I, I grew up in the Bay Area and I didn't realize what a small pond it was, you know, and a lot of my, the music I listened to is from New York. And I, and I had wanted, you know, a lot of my friends moved there and I sort of wanted to for a long time and then, it took me a long time because I love the Bay Area, so but I ended up doing it, and um, I love it. I love it here. I love the Bay Area too. But and so tell it. So yeah. So COVID kind of derailed what you were doing with Laswell. So I mean, how, how have you been? What have you been up to? How have you been dealing with all this? Well, I've been doing a lot of this kind of stuff on the computer, you know. Um, are you a musician, Bodhi? Yes. Um, I play the Rickenbacker, which is over there, if you can see it. Oh. Oh, right on. I can't really see it, though. <laughs> You're a Beatles fan, Bodhi. So let's yes. talk Beatles then. What's your, so that was your first favorite band. What was, like, what era do you like the most? What inspired you the most? You know, when... I get, I, I've gotten so far into music that I think of it in like centuries and, you know, so I went to music school and studied uh, classical music and I also studied Indian music and I studied African music, you know, not as deeply, but I uh, appreciate, you know, this whole long uh, 
history history of music. So like, I'm, I'm excited by everything. So when you say like a history of music, it sounds like you're going back like more what? Tell me like hundreds of years or looking to like yeah, rock music, classical music. Yeah, let's tell me a little bit more. Well, you know, like for instance, like you for Indian music, um, you know, you find out it's interesting to find out like for Indian music, for instance, you know, you think of this Indian classical music, Ravi Shankar or whatever. And then there's this different, if you study it more, there's all these different parts of it. And then you realize that a lot of, some of it came from Persia. Like there's this whole, uh, the Silk Road, you know, going over, uh, you know, people trading over, you know, trading ideas. And, and you know, you start thinking, well, music is just this thing of us trading ideas from culture to culture. And we're just in this latest period, which is unlike any other, but, um, and in, in an, a U.S. where we live, a lot of it is uh, Africa and uh, Europe coming together, right? That's like a big part of the music we listen to. So. Does that, does that like history of music, which is like having such a, um, just a wide palette, does that like play into your um, songwriting or at all? You know, I, I just try to be me, you know, and it just comes from whatever I think of at the time. I'm not trying to be anybody else. I gotcha. Is there a, like a, do you have a favorite type of like Indian instrument or like a favorite, a couple artists that you should turn us on to? Well, there's um, there are a lot of great Indian guitar players like uh, um, uh, Dabashish Bhattacharya. Is a, there's a, just look up Indian slide guitar players. I'm I, not sure if you know anything about that. but Yeah, I've seen where, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've listened to a lot of traditional Indian music, but I've seen where guys play and they are just, you know, super fast back and forth, super accurate back and forth on, on different frets. Have you ever seen that? Of course, yeah. That's, some, that's just some wild stuff. Have you ever thought about experimenting with like combining stuff like that? Or? Well, I mean, I played with uh, Jai. Do you know who Jai Utah is? No, tell us. We had a band called the Pagan Love Orchestra and we did a lot of Indian based music. So he was my Indian, sort of my guru. He was like a, a guy from New York, but he lived in the Bay Area. He's still there, he's in Marin County. Oh, okay, and I think. You got me you know, going to Ali Akbar College of Music and took some classes with Ali Akbar, Ali Akbar Khan. And, um, so, um, so, yeah, I have done, there was a period where I was really into that and I still love it, but, I, you know, it was kind of too much. You can't do everything, you know? Yeah, you know, I look at, I think about your trajectory and... Now it makes sense. You know, it seems like you're always coming up with great new ideas and new sounds, new records, but you know, it's still, it's still you. It's still kind of in this, this framework that, that, you know, that's recognizable. But now I just knowing that how deep your music interest goes, it explains a lot of why you've had such different, different bands, different sounds, man. That's congratulations. The first time we met Bill Laswell, he he produced uh, Jai's one of Jai's records called uh, Shiva Station, and so we I went there to his studio in Greenpoint. This was in the early '90s, I guess, and uh, mid '90s. I don't know, somewhere in the mid '90s. And uh, I went into his back room, and there was these big tapes, like a cassette tape, except for two. If you imagine a cassette tape, that's a quarter of an inch, right? Well, they used to record records on tapes that were two inches wide. Have you ever seen one of those, Bodhi? Yeah. Have you ever seen one? Yeah, I... Like a reel-to-reel -reel type thing? Yeah. Yeah, but they were like a full-on two inches, two-inch tape. Jeez, I don't think I even... That's, that's what they recorded all the old records on. And, I mean, well, in this, after a certain time. And they would go uh, like 60 inches per second. So like... Every second, there'd be like this many, they were super fast, right? So you get a lot of good quality on there. 
So I looked in Bat Laswell's closet and there was a uh, Bob Marley two inch tapes masters, you know, from the CBS and, and uh, Walt, uh, Miles Davis CBS masters. I, I guess there must've been copies, but. I remember he remixed a couple of those, but he did two remixes, of one of each of those, right? Yeah, yeah, Pantalasa, and he did the Bob Marley one. The yeah. Pantalasa was the Miles Davis one. Those are great. I, I love those. Those are great records. I remember that, seeing him play. We were mixing the Jai's record right when, when he was about to get do those. Okay, okay. I remember he did some things here in the Bay Area with um, Buckethead and Mike Patton years yep. ago. Some re really great stuff. I mean, I, I could see like New York being like a great next step for the Bay Area because I mean, it's such a great melting pot. We were just talking to like, um, one of the guys in an 80s metal band out here um, just this morning. And, you know, now we get to talk to, you know, jazz fusion legend. So, and that's just in our backyard. So, like, moving to New York, what's, tell us the big difference between, like, that scene versus the San Francisco Bay Area. Well, it's, um, for one thing, it's very close to Europe. You can get to Europe once, at one time you could travel, or you can't really much now, but. Yeah, I forgot what that was like. So, you know, I was in London with Stanton Moore and that was my last time out of the country it was in uh, January, I guess, January, February. And probably was right when I came back with all the people bringing COVID from uh, Europe, probably. Oh, I think it was the same time. <laughs> right after, not too much after that, they shut it down and everybody, Trump said everybody had to leave now. So there was like, all these people in these big lines get trying to leave Europe to come back and probably transmitting the disease to each other. But um, So what is my point? Oh, so I'm just saying it's like flying from here to Europe is kind of like six hours from here or something. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think for that reason, there's a lot more, stuff coming you know here from different places you know also to you know it's a good hub to go most a lot of places in the u.s and um i mean it just sounds like it's an even bigger melting pot right more culture there's like you know a thousand guitar players here that are as good as me or you know probably that's i love it or better than me you know so I'm always challenged by. I think that's the way you progress. You know, that's how I think, you know, that's how you get better at something is surrounding yourself around people that are, you know, that are, that know what they're doing or that are, that can, that are better than you. So you can, so you can learn, you know, but yeah, another question. I was in the Bay area, I was a handful of, I was in kind of the top handful of guitar players. And yeah. uh, I'm definitely not here. <laughs> Like getting back to like being in the top, you know, upper echelon of guitar players out here and having such a cool body of work. Like, what was your question? Like, uh, my question was out of all the Beatles movies oh, that the one. Beatles okay. made, um, what would be your favorite? I only watched two of them, which was The Yellow Submarine and The Magical Mystery Tour. Which were my favorite movies? Uh, yes. Beatles movies? Well, those were my favorite ones for sure. But, uh, well, I, you know, Yellow Submarine was a big movie for me when I was a kid. Because uh, I love art and I love, um, I love to draw. I love underground comics. I love cartoons and everything. So, you know, that blew my, do you like that movie, Yellow Submarine? Um, yes, um, that might be my favorite one. Um, I don't really like the Magical Mystery Tour that much, but I still watched it. Well, for me, the the Magical Mystery Tour—that's my favorite Beatles music, because they they really they really got to a place that was really different. And uh, some of the, that was a weird movie. I I love that movie though a lot, Magical Mystery Tour, because it's very psychedelic and experimental. But do you like? So, what are your some of your favorite Beatles songs? Um, hmm, my favorites. Uh, hmm. Okay, um, my favorite might be um, the Magical Mystery Tour. Um, 
Mm-hmm. All you need, that's all you need is one song. Yeah. Those are two songs from the Magical Mystery Tour record. Um, that's the first one and the last one, I think. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, Back in the USSR, um, yeah. strawberry fields forever. It's another uh, magical mystery tour song. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't know. Yeah, I think that I was. I feel like that's their best. It might not be a cohesive record, but it's like their best work. I think to me. I think it's got some great songs on it. I love Ringo's work yeah. on that one. So, yeah. I am the Walrus. Walrus is like mm-hmm. one of the yep. my. Bodhi has been researching um, all the characters and who they were. And so he's, yeah, every day he's been coming up to me. He's like, hey, guess that? Who guessed this was who? who? You I, know who they are. Tell me. Yeah, I now know who they are. Um, I thought Ringo was the walrus and oh, uh, yeah, was Ringo. the rabbit and, and George was the moose and <laughs> Mon was the <laughs> chicken. But I was very wrong. I was completely wrong. Um, the chicken. John was the walrus. <laughs> um, Paul was the walrus. Ringo was the duck, and Paul was the um, hippo, and uh, and George was the rabbit. You sure? I always thought Paul was the walrus. Wasn't the controversy about Paul and dying and the walrus and all that stuff? Um. Uh, you mean the Paul's dead theory? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. There's a. They all dressed up in the magical mystery tour, and somebody wore a walrus co- costume. So maybe that and might that be. That was. A, and I think that might be Paul, because I saw him play the Rickham, the bass Rickenbacker, and the music video. So I guess that's Paul. Well, you know, uh, you know, and the, you know that song, the Glass Onion. Wait, what? Yeah, the Glass Onion. Glass Onion. John sings. Here's a here's a clue for you all. The wal- walrus was Paul. Yeah, don't you remember that line? No. Oh God, we have to. We we're gonna have to listen to that tonight. So tell us about like you're like you have so many. You've worked with so many people. You have so many records out. Like, what's some of your favorite stuff that you've put out? My last one is my favorite at the moment. Called Free like- yeah, what's the um? Tell us a little bit about like what's the name mean? It's got it's a cool name, and well, um, my drummer Eric Kalb, who's comes up with great ideas sometimes. Name we had a song named that he came up with that, but that's actually from uh, Terry Gill- Gilliam's movie Brazil, which uh, I guess what you know it's like freelance subversives they were trying to fight against the whole. 1984 uh, takeover, like like where we're existing in right now, basically. Yeah. I love it, man. That's okay. So that's where it's from. Okay. So I mean, what is it about? What? So you know, I'm from Berkeley, so you know we have the free speech movement and all the subversives that we. Mario Savio, you know. Absolutely. I was listening to some of his speeches not too long ago. Um, yeah, man. So. All those people are uh, subversives, you know. They were marked as subversives. It used to be a bad word. It used to be something that, um, you know, you're targeted. But now, you know, I mean, you're from Berkeley. It's so people from the Bay Area, like, I think a lot of folks take it for granted that, um, you know, just the free speech, just being able to speak your mind and having people around you that are so passionate about, about a cause, right? You know? Mm-hmm. And I know that's been important to you. You've had, you've played in political bands, made Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy was very political. So, I mean, as, as being able, and a lot of your music's, um, you know, it's instrumental. So how do you get your point across? I mean, you obviously have ideas and, you know, how do you get that stuff across? Um, I'm not always trying to be political, you know, but I feel like being a musician is kind of a political statement, or an artist or a musician is a political statement because you ch- choose to do something different from the what they're trying to get you to do, you know, the, the norm, the um, fitting in with what the establishment wants you to do. 
and it's it's rough it's not easy you know all the time to to reach our goals yeah i agree man but it's like even just trying to be an instrumental music musician is a political statement because you're standing up for this beauty that you believe in and you know some kind of other alternate reality than um whatever you're whatever you hear on the well our kind of musician you know it's different from being a top 40 musician yeah you know. you know, i wanted to kind of get into that really quickly about jazz like it's not it's never really been this um a popular i mean it's been popular but it's never been like a mass consumed or it hasn't been in, a, in many decades right so i mean what is it why why is it something that's not so mass consumed by by folks nowadays well you know the funny thing is i I don't even know if I consider myself a jazz player. I don't. I don't really think like that. You know, I I study jazz, so I guess that means a lot of people don't. So that means I'm more a jazz person. But I like. You know, we've been talking about the Beatles for like five minutes. So yeah, and I, you know, I, 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 Dad, I like. You know, I love uh, George Clinton. I love you know everything. You know? And, and I I kind of wanted to be. I was more of a rock person, and I I studied classical. I got a degree in classical music. Oh wow! So um, I had sort of abandoned the whole jazz world for a long time, and then I got roped back in with uh, like Peter Affelbaum's Hieroglyphics Ensemble. Yeah, He's and we opened for that like three times, and Ornette Coleman, and toured with Don Cherry. And, yeah, and then uh, I met. Charlie Hunter at the time when uh, uh, hip hop and jazz were kind of experimenting, uh, having a little experiment and, and everybody wanted a piece of him. And we did TJ Kirk and that sort of brought me, I got in touch with all these people that were in this sort of jazz resurgence of like the funky kind of jazz from the seventies like uh, that was sampled in hip hop groups. So, um, like Grey Boy All All Stars and Galactic and things like that. Yeah, I mean that was a great little moment. It was like a youth, kind of a youth movement that was bringing jazz to younger people. Yeah, yeah, like Les Claypool's Prawn Song record, right? Wasn't that like one of the first? Right, that was just, uh, Charlie Hunter record. Beatles. So, I, all right, we're gonna start wrapping up, but I wanted to find out, you know, when you mentioned John McLaughlin, that was such um, eye opening. So. Your tone, you kind of have that tone a lot of the times. Tell me about some of your favorite guitar to, guitar tones. I have um, one of these. Oh, wow. What the heck is that, is that a, thing? Is that a little frying pan? It's uh, later than a frying, have you ever heard of a frying pan guitar? I just heard of one five seconds ago, not like she. We heard, we were talking about one yeah. earlier today. Yeah, um, we were looking at Rickenbacker. You said he played Rickenbacker. They made the frying pan guitar, and this is one of the earliest. <laughs> you know, this style of guitar is one of the earliest styles of guitar. Oh yeah, there's you. So you are a Beatles fan, huh? Is you like you like? Uh, is that why you have a Rickenbacker? Or you're more of a Who person. <laughs> I'm not more of a Beatles person. Let's hope he's not more like a Pete Townsend with that guitar. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, um, what was the question? I want to hear some of your favorite guitar tones, like growing up and like like nowadays. Because I, 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 when I think of your playing, I really think of your tone and, you know, you've had different tones on different records, but I think the new record, I just love the tone on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I had a good engineer that I really understood what I was trying to do, and the musicians really understood what I was trying to do. Um, I didn't really change my tone a lot. I used a lot of vintage stuff, old stuff. Like, and I have, I have the same guitar that I had when I was sixteen. It's one of the guitars I use a lot. This is not like one of the like the red. Oh, it's just a few years ago. So is it that that one of those ES thirty three thirty five? It is uh, that one, yeah. That's cool, man. 
So one you, I have is 1966 that I got in uh, from the classified flea market in like 1976 or 75 or something. Hey, from in Berkeley? Yep, yeah. That's where that riff is from. Uh, it's still my favorite guitar. That's great, man. Yeah, so like, tell me like your top three favorite guitar tones like from folks that really caught your eye growing up or nowadays. Oh, I mean, guitar. what do you mean tones? I don't know, just your favorite guitar players. Like, think of a record that just just that you just loved, that sounded great. Well, I really loved uh, Led Zeppelin, like uh, Jimmy Page stuff on Led Zeppelin. I thought he had a great tone. I loved uh, all the Beatles stuff. Um, still love it. I still listen to Beatles. I love it. Um, I liked, uh, yeah, I liked early, I liked the early er Eric Clapton with the cream. I liked the, you know, one thing I've gotten uh, especially into is like early blues stuff. I love, I love a lot of early blues. Like country Robert Johnson type of dudes? Those type yeah, of Robert dudes? Johnson. That's rad. Skip James and, um, I can't think of all the names, right? You know, all those guys. Oh yeah, man, I love it. Like Howlin' Wolf type of shit. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, those guys all used to play in Berkeley when I was a kid, but I didn't, I didn't see many of them. They play at the Freight and Salvage. If you go to the Freight and Salvage and you look up at the old calendars, you'd see like Skip James and. Oh yeah, the Freight and Salvage is a great spot. It's, it's fantastic. All these incredible legends that used to play there. But I can't complain because I saw I got a lot of great music. You saw Zeppelin, you said, in Berkeley. So um, what would uh, you give for advice for a guy who really wants to play in a band? Get real good. <laughs> Practice a lot. Just play all day long. Play, play along with records. Or uh, not records these days, but... <laughs> you know, um, YouTube, you know, you watch YouTube. Yeah. You can learn anything you want off of YouTube now. And also, when you said records, um, I do listen to records, literally. Like, there's a box of records over there. Actually, yeah, yeah there's basically a giant box of records over there. My dad collected, actually, like, four boxes. There's ones <laughs> here. Yeah, that's a good, you know, any music, you just um, try to play along with it, and then... Uh, if you have a computer, there's ways of, of getting these programs where you can uh, slow it down and you can play with along with it slow so you can figure it out what's what's going on. But but also like YouTube, I mean, I still like, I check out all these lessons, people give lessons for free basically on YouTube. You can yeah, take yeah. whatever you want to learn. I love it. Thanks, man. I find, uh, find people to play with. I have some songs that you learn already, you know, you're like, hey, want to play this song or this song? Have something to offer them. I could tell, you know, you've, you, it, it's, you know, just listening to you and like li following your career, you haven't stopped like learning and you haven't stopped being a fan of music and you, it seems like you're still consuming and still learning and, and we're the, like the happy beneficiaries and recipients of all that stuff, man. So. Well, thank you. I appreciate you uh, your interest. I love it, man. How's the new record doing? Is it um, well received? It's well received. I was planning a bunch of touring around it, which was the whole reason I made the record. And Bad obviously, it's not happening. So, how are you? Are you doing? Uh, connect, connect, get people to hear it. You know, I'm trying to meet people like you or whoever I can meet and try to get check out the record. Have you yeah. thought about um, like? Have you thought about like jumping on like Twitch and doing like any live streaming or any of those type of things for us? Yeah, you know, um, I did, I've i done some Facebook stuff. Um, I'm probably gonna do some live streaming in the near future to All support right. working with Jesse Cutler. Just trying to get some uh, more notice about this record because when it came out, there was a right in the height of the COVID thing. so. It was hard to get 
there was so much other stuff going on that it was hard to release a record and get people interested in listening to that, you know. Black Lives Matter and all this stuff that was happening then. Yeah, you got your word cut out for you with all that. And, you know. And the election and all, you know. Yeah. The other stuff, there's always something going on. So I'm just trying to, you know, for the next couple of months to see what I can do. And then I'll put out a new couple of new records next year. Are you, so you've been working on some new stuff? I have two other records recorded already. Really? Is it um, is it say, similar um, group, same people, or very different? Yeah. Oh man! All right, so we got stuff to look forward to. Mm-hmm. All right, so why don't you let folks know how to get in touch with you? Like what you know, what media outlets to find you on, really quickly? Okay, um, so you can uh, listen to my record on Bandcamp. You guys know Band Bandcamp? Oh yeah. You can listen to it, and if you have money, you can buy it. If, if if you don't, then you can listen to it, I think, for free, and then just make sure you follow me. You know, hit, you know, follow Will Bernard on Bandcamp. Is the record available on vinyl? Uh, it's not on vinyl yet. Uh, yeah, you can buy it on Bandcamp CDs. You can buy it off my website. You can uh, have a YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. I have uh, Facebook, you know two Facebook pages, a Twitter page, an Instagram page. Right on. We'll link to all that stuff. Page. Okay. We'll link to all that stuff for everybody that finds us. You're a good, good dancer, Bodhi. I already. You know, Bodhi Sattva. Got to be careful what you name your kids, right? Did you uh, st- sit under the Bodhi tree? Is that why you're so cool? No, I never sat on the Bodhi tree. Still need to find out where they mainly are. Because if they do, I'll I'll just make an Instagram photo if I do. Yeah, if you do, let me know, okay? Okay. Will, man, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us, man. Nice to meet you guys. You too, man. Great. Good luck with the record. All right. Thank you. To the next shit. Cheers. Take care. See ya. Bye.